are listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rich Outfield and Big Anklevich. Welcome to a special episode of the Dune Steve. <laughs> We've been doing it a year, I can't remember the name of the show. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume nothing. This is just this is like an insert. You have to collect proofs of purchase for this one and mail off to get it. That's what this one is. No page number whatsoever. And no one has mailed a single proof of purchase. <laughs> yeah, we still haven't gotten any purchases for that matter, much less proofs. We'll whine about that later. Today <laughs> is our first ever double header. Two stories for the price of, of none, actually. But uh, who's counting? As always, we are your hosts, Rhea Shoutfield. And Big Anklevich. R080T. I'm an outer man. Yeah. And him. All right, so the first story today is entitled Devo and is written by none other than Rish Outfield. The second story is The Shortest Ghost Story Ever Told by Big Enklevich. How about that? Devo by Rish Outfield. Doc Uleski had been on Alistair 5 for three long weeks when the shuttle finally landed. Oh, his team had learned a great deal about the planet, and he had enjoyed the work thoroughly, but he was more than happy to be going home. Only security officer Puente, now sporting a neatly trimmed, and irritating, little mustache, wouldn't allow him to get on board. He stood inside the half-opened shuttle bay door, barring Uleski's way. I'm sorry, Doc, he said, shaking his head. But we got a warning from the Epimetheus a week or so ago. They were down here for soil samples in June. Huleski shrugged. So? Apparently, their crew experienced something called de-evolution here. We can't allow any of your group to come on board at this time. Doc Huleski glanced back at the four members of his research team, who were trying their darndest to get their equipment and flight suits ready. They wanted to get out of here every bit as much as he did, and had stared at the shuttle's slow descent like children waiting for the ice cream android. He leaned in to speak quietly to Puente, but the man flinched as though interacting with a leper. Huleski cleared his throat. This stooge probably didn't even know what de-evolution meant. Mr. Puente, I'm a scientist. Don't you think I would have seen signs of de-evolution if it was happening? The slowest member of my team is a match for any genius from the Epimetheus, let alone a smug security hand. Puente put up his hands. Calm down, Doc. It's nothing personal. We'll get things sorted out as soon as we can. Well, we prefer things to be sorted out on the Hermes. His men were tired, grouchy, and could all use deep scrubbing. Sorry, Puente said, standing even straighter. You're not allowed back yet, just for safety reasons. Huleski was suddenly furious. I'll lodge an official complaint against you, Puente. We'll have you and your new mustache in front of a board of inquiry before you've earned another hour's leave. Doctor, I'm sure there are no signs of de-evolution among any of us on this planet. And to prove his point, he made a ball of his own feces and hurled it at the security officer. All right, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that story, because if you did, you're the only one. That may be true. We've been using this particular story as a sort of audition piece. Uh, people will say, hey, you know, we'd like to help you out with your podcast, make it a little less shitty. So Big would send them out this story, have them record it, and we could hear what their voice quality sounded like, how they did the different voices. And uh, what did you do on the edit exactly? I took two uh, auditions that we got, one from Josh Roseman and one from Amory Lowe, and I kind of cobbled the two of them together and made it into one complete version. Uh, Josh was the narrator in the story, and Amory did the voices for the two characters. So that's how we put it together. It's a very, very short story. Figure take somebody a couple minutes to record, and we would have an example of how they sound, what kind of accent they have, what their dramatic range is. And yeah, I don't know how much we want to pretend that this is a real episode. Basically, it was our anniversary show, and we are talking so much about where we've been for the last year that we thought, hey, let's just keep it short. We'll do a short story by me, a short story by you, and then next week we'll get on to the real talent. You said it, Rish. 
So tell us about the story. Why did you write it? What's the deal behind it? Basically, when I lived in L.A., I auditioned for the game show Jeopardy. You go onto the Sony lot and you fill out a form. Then they hand out a test with several questions, which are all sorts of general questions. Then you hand that in. Whoever is in the upper, I don't know, 75th percentile, whoever gets a certain score and above is asked to stay. Everyone else is sent home. Sent home. Those that remained were invited to participate in a mock game with two other finalists, if you want to call them, or, or semi-finalists. And of those three, the one who won the mock game would be a finalist. And I don't know if they narrow it down from there and those guys go on to the show or if just the winners of the mock games go on to the show. What are you saying? You're mocking me, aren't you? Oh, because I said keep mock. saying mock game. Basically, I am heading somewhere with this. I made it to that semi-final round. We got up there. We had to say a little bit about ourselves and then play a fake game. And You lost already just when they had you talk about yourself, huh? Yeah, it was, it was an interesting, fun experience. But once you're up there and the lights are on you and fake Alex Trebek is asking you these questions. <laughs> oh, they had a fake Alex Trebek. That's his... awesome. Did he, have like the, did he look like Alex no, Trebek? No, no. He was just a dude. <laughs> oh. And they'd ask the questions and the pressure is on and you're competing against two other people. And so every answer that I got wrong, I hate myself for. <laughs> and it, what's weird is I can remember them to this day. And uh, the question that I remember most vividly was, the 80s band Devo got its name from this scientific term. And do I want to tell the truth? Tell the truth, you crybaby! But it makes me sound like a complete and utter moron. Well, that's why it's funny. Okay, so the first person rang in and said, what is devolution? And fake Alex said, I'm sorry, that is wrong. Second person rang in and said, what is evolution? Fake Alex said, incorrect. So I'm like, okay, okay. And I, of course I had to ring in. In retrospect, why didn't I just pass? I didn't know. And they said, Rish. And I said, what is devolution? <laughs> Which was exactly the same thing the first the person same said. thing. And they're like, I'm sorry, you're an idiot. Uh, and, and that was wrong, obviously. <laughs> Fake Alex is a little meaner than regular Alex. The correct answer is, what is de-evolution? And I hung my head in shame and I had been disqualified. And that haunted me for a long time. And basically they would have Jeopardy auditions, I think like once every six months or something like that. And so I had been getting all excited and looking forward to this day because I think I had missed the deadline the first time. And... I had my chance to be on Jeopardy, and I blew it. You could have been a real cop, and you blew it. So you wrote this story. Was this one of those ones you wrote as a Drabble? That's right. I wrote it initially for the Drabble cast, hoping that they would accept it. I don't know how many words it is, 300, something like that. I pared it down to 100 words, sent it off to our friend Norm. I'm sorry, your friend Norm. <laughs> uh, he promptly rejected it, as he always does. But that's fine. If it wasn't up to snuff, then it wasn't up to snuff but it was good enough to make it back here on my own show Ooh. that's really all i have to say about it i felt like calling a story devo based on that i i think what the character actually uses the word de-evolution hopefully if i did my job no i think the character said devolution God and then that's how they knew that he had de-evolved is because he couldn't use proper scientific terms <laughs> Well, actually, you've just made my story sound better. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So should we move on to the next story then? No. I think so. And, and folks, like the many, many girls that Big deflowered, just be <laughs> gentle in the comment section and uh, let us down easily. You didn't yeah. pay anything for this story. Although, if you want to send us a donation, then you're free to just yeah. rip them apart. Rip it apart. Go in there and say what you think of these stories because, yeah. I'm not sure why we chose these stories, really. I don't think it's... I think it was because we already had Devo audio done. Right. And we were talking about a ghost story. I, I think we'll do that story next week where we actually talk about the ghost story. Oh, yeah. Because it's right. officially our, our anniversary right now. And we just talked back and forth. It might not even have made the air where we were <laughs> talking about, hey, remember that short, short, short ghost story you wrote at one time? Yeah. The funny thing is it's not as short as it should be. <laughs> Oh, well, I guess that's just the way things go. The Shortest Ghost Story Ever Told by Big Anklevich My name is Claudia Johansson, and this is my story. 
I've seen a lot of horror movies and read a lot of ghost stories. A list including names like Stephen King, Dean Koontz, and Wes Craven sounds to me like a list of dear old friends. Most of what those guys produce is pure imagination. Just a bunch of crap. They've got to make the tension increase and get the pulse racing so people don't always act the way they should. I haven't watched a horror movie or read a scary story in 15 years. I don't even like to go camping anymore because people have that annoying habit of trying to tell ghost stories around the campfire. I don't like to hear the stories because they always remind me of the time when I lived one. I was only 27 at the time, newly married with a two-year-old daughter. We had moved out of our apartment into our first house. We didn't buy the house, heavens no. We couldn't afford to do that for another six years. We were renting. We found a large house for an exceptionally low price. It had four bedrooms, a living room, and a family room, a full-size kitchen with a breakfast nook, and a separate dining room. There was a spacious backyard, and it sat on a hill, allowing beautiful views from every window. And we could rent all that for less than what we paid at the apartment we were moving from. The price should have alerted me to the fact that there was something wrong. <laughs> the landlord sure didn't. He was tight-lipped about it all, skirting around my questions about the strange looks the neighbors gave us when they stopped in front of the house. Like a doofus, I fell in love with the place and forced, well, persuaded my husband to go for it. We moved in on a Saturday, and my husband Greg was back to work on Monday. I, however, took the week off to unload boxes and square the house away. I wandered through the house that morning, puzzling over where I should put things. It really was a beautiful house, stripping with trimming and molding everywhere. I love Victorian houses. The landlord had told us that the house was more than a hundred years old. It had originally been built to house railroad executives back when the Union Pacific Railway was new. I guess I should have clued in there, too. If it was such a historic house, why was it being rented to any old piece of white trash that could scrape together a few bucks? I missed all the clues, but it didn't matter because the mystery wanted to be discovered anyway. I walked down the steps into the basement, which was nothing more than a cement-floored storage area, and the door slammed shut behind me. The light, just a bare bulb hanging from the ceiling, shattered, leaving me in complete darkness. The box of laundry soap I was planning on storing down there slipped from my hand, spilling its contents as it bounced down the last four steps of the stairway. It settled on the floor with a soft scraping sound, and then all was quiet. Great, I said, as much to break the silence as to express my frustration at being stuck in the dark basement. I turned to ascend the staircase, when I noticed that the room was beginning to lighten. I looked around, but could not pinpoint the source of the steadily increasing glow. Suddenly, a form coalesced. It was human in shape, but I could see right through it. So I guess it was human no longer. It appeared to be a woman, but I couldn't say for sure. Its face was too skeletal. The hairs on my body prickled. I had seen so many movies, but there was nothing like seeing it for real. This was a ghost. It wore flowing robes that danced around in some ectoplasmic whim. As soon as its form coalesced completely, it began to increase in size. Suddenly, there was a screaming, one that I felt more than heard. In fact, I'd be willing to swear that it wasn't an audible scream at all. I heard it in my mind, or in my heart, and it shook my bones like a gorilla shaking the bars of his pen. My knees grew weak, and I plopped gracelessly on the stairs. The ghost continued to scream and increase in size until its luminescent head filled the basement. It approached me, its mouth open in apparent agony. The scream began to take shape, and I felt, not heard, the words. Who are you? I couldn't bring myself to speak. Who are you? Claudia. I finally stammered, and could muster no more. 
not even my last name. Although, I suppose that the ghost probably didn't really care. Why are you here? Um, I, I live here, I gasped. This is my domain. Leave. The ghost dissipated and the door to the upper floor flew open. I took this to be my invitation to go. And I didn't even bother to RSVP. I just went. Now here is where my experience in horror movies and books took hold. I suppose my naturally cynical nature helped as well. In movies, the main character, myself, would now try and get to the bottom of this ghostly mystery. This character would doggedly remain in the house until she finally cracked the mystery. Or the mystery cracked her and she wound up dead. But I had seen all those movies and cynically wisecracked about what I would do in the main character's place. If a ghost told me to go, I would go. And that's what I did. I came out of the basement door, collected my two-year-old from in front of the TV, opened the front door, and never set foot in that house again. I went to my husband's workplace and explained to him that we were not going to move into the house after all. He objected, then scoffed when I told him why, but I was adamant. If I had to divorce him and never lay eyes on him again, then so be it. I would never go into that house again. He finally caved in. We hired movers to remove the stuff that we had in the house and wound up losing all of our security deposit, but I still count myself lucky. I could have been like so many characters I'd seen in films who ended up separated from their heads because they wouldn't heed the counsel of a well-meaning ghost. Well, maybe the ghost is acting out of pure selfishness, but who am I to criticize? They're in charge. I'm always listening late at night to the creaks and groans my present house makes, praying that they really are just the wind. I haven't had a run-in with the ghost since, and I'll continue to do my best to avoid it. That's my story, and perhaps the shortest ghost story ever told. Okay, so I hope you guys enjoyed that story. I don't think it's likely, but you never know. Who read that for us? That was Nicole Suddeth, one of our associate editors, and uh, she's also done voices for us before. I think she was uh, on... Sadie Worth. Yeah, that's it. The Ghost of Sadie Worth. She did uh, the teenage girls that were at the graveyard. So, where did this story come from? I wrote this one a long time ago. It's been like eight years probably since i wrote this thing or so maybe only seven but it's been a while yeah it was back when you were living in la and i was living in uh, sacramento and we just email each other back and forth all the time and i'd sent you i think i'd recently sent you a story of mine one of our broken mirrors if i remember right it may have been the first broken mirror that we ever did and then afterwards i don't know why the idea came to me well that broken mirror story was monstrously long it was also a ghost story, and you felt like, well, why don't I write the shortest ever ghost story since I've definitely well, written the longest? Yeah, we can go all the way back to college when we were going to, to film school, and we had a documentary class together. And our documentary teacher preached a lot about letting things happen. And he talked about Nanook of the North, which is a really old uh, silent film documentary. They show Nanook build an igloo. And, you know, they show the whole process and you watch him build an igloo for 10 or 15 minutes or something like that. And he just talks about how wonderful this is because you get to really see it happen. And he even brought in his home video of his kid and he showed us like five minutes of his home video as it led up to this really funny part where like his kid stuffs a banana in his mouth and then turns and looks at the camera and smiles. And, you know, it, the moment only worked because we saw all five minutes leading up to it. And, you know, he preached a lot on that whole thing and so rish thought it would be funny <laughs> if we put together a documentary called the longest bowel movement ever <laughs> and he wanted to set up a camera in the bathroom and then we'd see somebody walk in go into the stall close the door sit down you see their pants drop 
And then all of a sudden, you see a clock appear in the bottom corner. And the film ratchets up into super high speed. And you see people coming in and out and in and out and in and out. You know, really fast like that Madonna freaking Ray of Light video or something. No, no, no. no Madonna Ray oh, of Light, please. Sorry. And everything's just moving really fast, you know. And, and the feet and the person in the toilet stall never move through that entire time. And then finally, the film slows back down. The guy flushes and comes out. And the and the, the timer at the bottom has showed how much time has elapsed. Yeah, the elapsed And time. it is a record yeah. for the longest bowel movement ever. <laughs> so we thought that would be funny. We never actually did make that movie, unfortunately. But uh, as usual, our ambition outstretched our grasp. <laughs> but it was a joke that we always would bring up every now and then. For short, we called it The Longest, and then Bowel Movement Ever was like the subtitle underneath. So to go along with this, I made The Shortest Ghost Story Ever Told. It's not like I really have anything to say for my author's note, but you always see people yelling at people in horror movies for being stupid and not running away when they get the first chance and leaving. Everybody's always like, what is that? I'm curious. I'll go investigate. So yeah, this person just does what somebody should if they're suddenly approached by a ghost and told to leave a house. You and I weren't together around this time. We were seeing other people. Oh, you dear. were telling me a lot about this house that you moved into. There, there, there was something about the house and it was fodder for more than one story. Yeah. Now, was this the house? No, the house in this one is based after a house that my sister lived in. She actually lived in a house that was over 100 years old and had been built for the railway executives back in the day. And it was this really old Victorian house and it was really cool, but it wasn't haunted. So it wasn't really cheap to rent. They paid plenty. There's a lot of people back east that know that they're not listening to the show, but there's a lot of people back east that know houses that are 100 years old or more. But out here, it's more uncommon. Yeah, if Mike Stone is listening across the pond, he's probably right. thinking, 100 years old. That's right. That's <laughs> just new off the lot. But uh, yeah, so that's my terrible story. It's definitely not, I don't think, one of my best. Just a small joke made into too long of a story. And yeah, that's what mine is too, is a joke. And there's the punchline. And I found in writing multiple unacceptable drabbles for Norm <laughs> that the only way in my mind to have a satisfying story that's only 100 words long is for it just to be a joke. Because uh -huh. how can you have interesting characters or even interesting dialogue with only 100 words? Well, you're lucky if you have space for dialogue for that yeah. matter. But anyway, that, that's an argument for another time, if even worth <laughs> mentioning. And yeah, just thanks for uh, letting us indulge ourselves on this very special day. Okay, so it's July. July is finally here. Finally. And that means one thing. Transformers 2 has at last hit theaters. Ah, about that. Warning, today's episode contains the F word. Oh, well, that sort of takes the wind out of my sails. But never mind. Yeah, that's probably the best way to uh, look at it. For all of you, never mind. Besides Transformers 2 being the, the greatest movie ever released... Right. July is significant for another reason. Oh, I thought we were going to talk more about Transformers. Is there something else? Fate rarely shits upon young men like you, Spike Witwicky. But the time has come. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. You need to leave the cough in. I don't know if there's any point in talking about the 2007 Transformers. Either you like it or you don't. And I don't think there's any convincing the people that like it that it's crap. Just as... People try and explain why it's good to me, and I'm not buying. Yeah. So it's one of those, me. you know, it's either you see the color blue or you don't. You can't force a colorblind person to see the color you see. I, sorry. I, but, I totally agree with you. And that's more than enough time spent on Transformers because that was a crap fest. I, one more thing I no, got to say about... No, crap no, fest. Just, Stop. My cousin really Stop likes it. trans... I only hey, shot the one... We're talking about other things today because July is special for another reason. I think you mentioned that. Here at the Dune, Steve, we think it's special because July 1st, 2008 was when we put out our first episode. I believe that was episode zero. That was the one where we were just introducing ourselves and talking about what the Dune Steve would be. 
Yeah, that was when we were sitting down in my basement using my old computer that didn't work well and it was popping and sometimes our voices would just slow down right in the middle of it and then they would speed back up and it was nasty and we had to put the disclaimer at the start saying, we apologize for the crappiness of our first episode. Please, come back, please. How many people do you suppose listened to episode zero and said, <laughs> one, Beep, these guys? I wonder, man, how many? That's the only time we ever recorded down there, right? Yeah, I think so. For a long time, we think, were at your kitchen table. Yeah. And now we are in your, what do you call this? Office, Dan? I call it the study. Study. Yes. Cool. Well, it's been a year. Uh, I, I checked, and we're just over 31 hours of recorded art. Ooh, art, and, is it? And uh, you recently went back and listened to the whole back catalog, am I right? I didn't make it all the way through. It was too boring. Wow, our own show. <laughs> I started at the beginning and I listened to like the first two issues, probably the summer and fall. But uh, yeah, then I got uh, distracted with other stuff and I never finished listening to the uh, winter or spring. And yeah, it was really an interesting uh, thing to do. We've learned a lot of things, I think, over this first year. We've, I think, managed to make the uh, sound quality a lot better than it used to be. There was a lot more hiss. There was a lot more... I used to try and go through and, and level the sound off frame by frame or whatever you want to call it. I don't even know how it works in audio. It's all video for me. But yeah, I used to go through and, and play the thing and I'd be pulling this part up and bringing this part down and trying to level the sound off so that nothing was going into the red and nothing was too low to hear. And it just was that a lot of work. I think that's probably half of the reason why we used to only get like one episode every two or three weeks for a while is because uh, it took me so long to do that. And I'm so glad to have found a better tool to do that with. Um, and that tool is Nicole. <laughs> Wait, you're the tool around here, right? No, actually, I, and I got a lot of help from our listeners. We've had several listeners who obviously have experience with audio, and they would send me an email and say, Hey, have you tried this? Have you tried that? So I tried those things, and boy, were they good suggestions. See, I was just going to say that the amount of work that I do is so much more now than it was when we first started. That might also have something to do with why we used to have only one episode every two and a half weeks, and now it's much sooner. I, and one thing that's very obvious, if you've listened to us back then and now, is our episodes are so much longer. <laughs> so well, why do you suppose that is? Well, a lot of it was, you know, when I first started, I was under the impression that we needed to keep our chatter to a minimum. People would just get sick of it real easy. And so you would go through and you would edit it up and you would send it to me and I would go through and cut another 10 or so minutes out. And you would curse my name and fall to your knees and scream, Con! And so <laughs> at a certain point, I just said, why bother? And I just kind of let it go. What was the first long episode we had? Wally was long, and, and our Dark Knight episode, I mean, seriously, we had like a 700-word story that day, and we were still an hour long on that episode. And I have our original Wally and our original Dark Knight conversation that I saved because I knew you were going to hack the shit out of it. <laughs> And yeah, so so there was a lot more Dark Knight stuff right. originally. And now, if Dark Knight came out in 2009 rather than 2008, I'm sure our episode would have been 90 minutes. Yeah, it probably would. Sometimes, you know, you just, like two weeks ago, we had that episode, which was called Trailblazing, where the story was 45 minutes long. What is our longest story that we've done? Okay, next question. Why didn't you burn the tapes, Mr. Nixon? When the president does it, it's not illegal. What Of all the episodes we've done, which one has been downloaded the most? I think it has to be uh, episode three, which was uh, Michael Stone's Raising Archie. Wait, why, why do you think that is? I don't know. I've never been able to understand that. One time I searched on Google for the Dune Steef and like that episode comes up as like the third or fourth thing that you search for. So maybe it has something to do with that. If you would say maybe it's because everybody loves Michael Stone, you know, I could understand that. But it outperforms the other Michael Stone story. So it's not necessarily that. I, I really don't understand. But I have to admit, it's one of my favorite stories that we've done. It's really good. 
but it still goes on. Every week I can look at the stats and see how many times people have downloaded each episode. There's always new listeners that are coming in and going all the way back to the start and downloading episode zero and then never listening again. And then there's some that listen to the other ones as well. And yeah, there's always like 50% more people that are listening to uh, Raising Archie. At least it's a good story, so I can't say, oh, why did they have to pick Naughty or Nice to be the episode that they're going to listen to? <laughs> hey, how dare you? <laughs> you said it, Big. Okay, wh- what would you say is your favorite episode that we did in that first year? Hmm. I'm the guy that goes through and puts in all the sound effects for the most part and does the work on the story half of the show, whereas you're the guy that goes through and... Edits down our conversations and... And works hard on that half of the show. So the ones that I like the best are the ones that I did a lot of, I think, really cool things with. Um, One of my favorites that I really liked, and it's probably one of the first ones where I really got into getting into the sound effects, was Framing and Mounting Fairies. I really enjoyed that one, and I thought it was really cool to be able to put those sound effects in. I think it even enhanced the story a lot more than the story could have been just read normally because, you know, the sound effects went exactly with what we're saying and some of them were just so terribly gruesome or whatever you know you hear the the body of the fairy being slid onto the pin or whatever you know or or some of the screams i I, that was one of my favorite parts too is where it says open the jar and be sure that you've got your cotton balls in while the scream dissipates and you know you hear the jar open and then you're ah and the scream goes Rampion in the bell tower was fun as well, just coming up with all the uh, the bell ringing sounds to go with it. And it was a really good story as well, you know. That's one of the things that you also get to know when you're doing the story editing side, because I don't spend just one time listening to the story. It's it probably what like a copy editor goes through as they go through and just peel the story apart and get rid of all those errors. Oh, I think it's far worse than that. I've edited a few of the stories on our show, and it's more like you wrote it yourself, and you're doing <laughs> revisions. Yeah. And every single sentence you hear four or five times. Right. You really get to know it, and you realize, oh, this is payoff for that earlier part, because you've heard it so many times that you don't miss any of those little intricacies that the authors threw in there. And when you find those payoffs, you know, it really shows you just how good of a story you've got. It's way more attention than I probably even ever put into my own stories, for that matter. Yeah, um, uh, there's a lot of other episodes that I really liked. I liked uh, Creature of the Sea. That was one of my favorites. Did we talk about how we came up with the sound for the creature? <laughs> I don't know if we did or not. But well, yeah, that was your niece, right? Yeah, I had her hum. And I said, just, you know, hum something. And so she hummed five or six notes. And then... I slowed it down, uh, so it did sound. It sounded like whale yeah, song. Yeah, sounded only, like whale song. Who stuff. knew it would work out? But it sure did. Yeah. Unfortunately, I had only the one recording of her doing that. If I had known, did I edit that story, or did I just no, send you was, the sound? You sent me the sounds. I actually <clears throat> edited it. If I had known, you know, how many times that would have come up, I would have had her do three or four different right. tunes, and then we'd d- done all that. But you know, these are things that we learn yeah, that's from the production of, of the show. And there are lots of times when I'm editing our conversation and I start to, then I interrupt. Oh, well, but then I fix it. Or I never said I start to say something and then I realize I've gone off track and I never finish it. I, I've just left words out and it's like, well, how the hell do we edit that? How do we <laughs> make that point across? And yeah, sometimes it doesn't get done. And and, and in just doing the show, sometimes the other one will say, hey, hey, you didn't finish your sentence. Can Uh you you say that again? And and these are just things that we've learned with time. Yeah, I think we've learned definitely a lot over the the year. You don't want to say years, huh? Does it feel like it's been years? I was going to say months, but I hope that I'm not the only one that thinks this, but I think our show has improved a lot. Some of the ones that I really enjoy are ones where we spent a lot of time doing some of the sound effects in the background. They would say, the class laughed or something, and so me and you will go, ah. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. We just do it again and again, and then you'll throw in some. Uh, you'll whatever. see me when you got no class. Uh. All that kind of stuff that we'll throw in that just makes it a little bit more enjoyable. It entertains you in the editing process. Yeah, that, that's always good. You got to keep the mix right so that it doesn't. Hey, hey, we have no problem with Irish here. You got to keep it from overpowering the real narration. You know, you don't want people to be distracted by what we're saying in the background. But, you know, when we did The Ghost of Sadie Worth, and we're talking about the teenagers that showed up in the graveyard, we're making sound effects of these teenagers talking to the cop. And you're back there, oh yeah, no, check her out. Come on, man, she's got big jugs. Look at that chick. Come on, man. Ain't you Let ever been young? You know, it's just funny stuff. And people probably never heard what you said, but it was fun for me. The one that I think of is with Mars in his hand, where there was the character of Chino, <laughs> and there was some part where she starts babbling in Chinese to herself. And because I, I don't speak Chinese or know any Chinese, I didn't know how to make believable sounding Chinese with, you know, that chow chu jing thing. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> uh, and so we went to the IMDb and we looked up Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and I started saying the names of the people that were part of the production crew <laughs> like it was a sentence. Yeah. If you listen closely, you hear about Zhang Yimo and Zhang Ziyi and Michelle Yeo. You actually sang that one, if I remember right. Of course... We didn't actually use it, but... What? Michelle Yeo! I did not. <laughs> you did. But that was another one of my favorite ones. I remember being really proud of myself for what I did. But, yeah, I don't know how, how great it is. I'm, it's not like I'm the one who's listened to the most things in the potosphere. I bet there's probably podcasts out there that uh, put ours to shame. Or... Well, if so, kudos to them. Yeah. Because the amount of time it takes yeah, just seriously. to find or make sound effects and mix them and record them and have other people record and send you the file and I, we could bore the hell out of you. See, I'm cursing a lot on this episode. <laughs> we could continue to bore you with minutia about how the episodes are put together and it would still only be the tip of the iceberg of what a headache it is and something that we discovered just two weeks ago was we get an episode done, want to put it out and we don't have enough storage, free space. In a, yeah, and a storage space so on our uh, Libsyn account. But Whatever. Nobody cares about our show anyway, so they don't mind if it doesn't show up. Yeah, people don't care that we're just now talking about Beowulf, but we recorded it right after that movie came out. Yeah, it's just, it just took a while. What, uh, what episode did you like best, Rish? You know, probably my favorite episode overall was Uberman. Oh, yeah, that was a really good one. It was the essence of what we are all about with the Dune Steve, where it was just you and me, uh -huh. where That's it was just yep. two characters talking right. back and forth. Yeah, it was a radio play. And you did that awesome thing with Deutschland, Deutschland, Uber <laughs> Alice at the beginning. Yeah. And it was all about superheroes or supervillains, which I loved anyway. It was a short story. It was fun to read. And then we did the conversation about our favorite villains. And I love to do the list. Give me your list and that kind of thing. <laughs> right. That was one of those episodes. I think it was probably the first episode where people really got into commenting about it. There was like 15 comments and everybody got in there. Oh, yeah. What about this villain? We didn't get a lot of comments when we first started. And I was always worried that nobody listened to the banter after the story. And I just thought, gosh, this is a lot of work. If nobody's listening, uh, maybe I shouldn't do this anymore. But it, I've gotten the impression lately that people really like it. And, yeah, um, hopefully that's true. And another thing, since it's a year, I always wanted to know whether our explicit rating, whether it scared people off, whether there were people who saw that word and said, oh, you know, this one's not for me or, or, or something like that. And there's no way of knowing because if they see yeah. explicit and it scares them off, then they're not listening they to know. tell us. But I wonder, are we explicit? Well, I, I, you keep swearing. I mean, you said yourself that you swear a lot this episode and other episodes. You also say, hey, I swore a lot today. Right. But that doesn't necessarily brand something as explicit. It, you know how it used to be with the motion picture ratings. And there right. were certain words that you could get away with you in a G and something in a PG times. and something in a PG-13. And I don't think that we have episodes that are filled with serious cursing. Right. We've had a few episodes that I think would have to be considered explicit. Is it just because of that word? Is that what it is? I mean, if if a rapper puts out an album and one song has that word in it, they're not going to get the explicit rating. I don't think it's just that word. There's also like thematic elements, I think, that would make us explicit. And I think like horror stories, I think. 
well, some violent or adult content, thematic elements, uh, sexual content. We don't do a lot of that, but there are some stories where stuff like that comes up. There was one where a, a guy had sex with a fairy while her wings were still out. I don't know if that qualifies it for explicit or what people would say, but the idea that we always had from the beginning, and we I think we said it in episode zero, was we're not going to set a rating for this thing. We want parents to listen to it and say, this is okay for my kid or this isn't, and then they can do that. And I don't know if we've blown it. Maybe we've had stories that were okay for kids, and then afterwards we get on there and say, oh, yeah, that episode contains the F word. And then we said it a bunch of times or, or something and negated the fact that they could have listened to the story. I don't know. But yeah, I've never really worried too much about it. I figure we're not an erotica podcast. We're not something that's really dark and nasty. Okay, let's use Escape Pod for okay. an example. And there have been episodes where Steve comes on and goes, Warning, this episode contains fill in the blank. You know, parental This disc- episode is rated X. He rates them, remember? Oh, that's right. He goes, warning, this episode is rated X. X. Keep it away from small children. And then I hear the episode. There have been a couple that were rated X. And I thought, you could show that on TV. X? Really? That was X? Or there have been a couple where there's no warning. And I go, ooh, gee, wow, okay. And so I guess it's just all, it's all subjective, but yeah, I think that's why we wanted to leave that up to other people to figure it out too, is for that very reason. My sensibilities and your sensibilities are probably a little different and my sensibilities from some other person that I don't know so well may be very different, but it's just life is explicit. Life is offensive. Life is hard and rough and unpleasant a lot of times. And so I'm not as easy to offend as some people. Good for them if life is so rosy and cheerful that hearing somebody say a word suddenly puts a dark cloud over their lives or offends them or makes them, you know, veer off the freeway because they're reaching for the off button so hard. Um, Who knows? I don't think we need to change that. I think we'll continue to go on as we are. Well, if, if anybody is listening and you'd like to comment on that, I'm curious what your thoughts are on the whole explicit rating thing. Let's say that there was a record album and Walmart wouldn't sell it because it has that rating thing on it. Would you automatically not buy it? Record album. Back in my day, before the Andes came. Rish, you're such an idiot. So we've done a year. I think it's perfect that we've decided to go out on, on a year and, and, and not do any more episodes. To, you know, wait, it just, wait, it's like big... That's the last one? I, I was under the impression that this was it. Oh, I think anybody will care. It'll... You know, normally I would joke and say, hell no. Hell no, Big Anchorage! But I think there are people that really enjoy what we do. And, yeah, and, I think so too. And I'm glad. They're not nearly enough people. <laughs> well, hey, now that it's been a year, uh, I, I want to thank... The many people who have helped us. Should we name names? Uh, sure. I'd, I'd like to give everybody, you know, a shout out for all the help that we've gotten from all the people through the first year. But there's the rub. If we name names, we're going to forget somebody or miss somebody or mispronounce. We don't say your name. Don't be offended. Yeah, I guess we'll just start with the various categories, what the people do. So we'll just name a category and... Uh, we'll... Looks like my lucky day. I'll take the rapists for 500. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Connery. That's a therapist's. Anyways. Okay. So, so, oh, sorry. We're, Go ahead. we're just fighting over things. I want to thank first. I guess the first person who helped us was Announcer Man. Announcer just... Man has been there from the start. Should we thank that guy? He's always so mean. Big, you're crazy. He is mean, but in a lovable sort of way. Well, maybe. Yeah. Thanks, man. You can go back out. Finish your cigarette, man. See you guys later. <laughs> Um, but yeah, besides announcer man, probably voice talent. Uh, your wife has helped. Your kids helped. I think your sisters. I've had a couple of sisters help us out. Like brother-in-law or something like that. Guys at work helped you I out. I did get several people at work to help me out. Of course, there's Liz Mirzieski who has helped us on countless stories, it seems. I suppose you probably could count them. Oh, well, who knows? We might not have credited her. <laughs> That's probably true. And Abigail Hilton has also helped us a lot. We'd really like to thank her for all all the help that she's given us. We've had Nicole Suddeth do a little bit of voices for us. Josh Roseman has done voices for us. Cameron, our buddy from Australia. That's right. He did a whole story for us. And Jacinta. Did I get the name right? That's right. 
<laughs> uh, we had our buddy uh, Elise Krawick do two stories, I think, all by herself. That's right. And voices. We had uh, Emma Dewberry. Do, do, do back? Dewberry. The Dewback, the big lizards that were ridden in Star Wars. Emma Dewberry did a, a couple of stories for us. She's, we had Bennett Jackson do some voices for us. And Amory Lowe has also done voices for us as well. Cool. Uh, Christine Maya Flares did some voices for us. That's a cool name. Of course, we had Norm Sherman help on that one story. Or he read that whole story. Awesome. You know what? We ought to ask Norm if he'll help us with another one. I think he'd say no. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and Oliver Donahue did voices for us once as well. That was really cool. He did a great job. Gosh, there's so many. I'm sure that we've probably forgotten somebody. I think we've mentioned everybody that's helped us out. If not, I hope you're not offended with us. But Well, you mentioned Liz Wersbowski, and <laughs> she also did a drawing for us for Megan's Bridge. That's right. So yeah, it was really cool. Have, who else has done art for us? My friend Mitch Cudney was uh, one of our artists. He did the uh, picture of Tinkerbell pinned to the board uh. <laughs> that we used for uh, framing and mounting fairies. And we've also had Rick who is kind of a man of many talents, but Rick has also done a lot of pictures for us for, for various episodes. He did that really cool uh, one with the diver for Aqualung where you can kind of see the shadow of like the mermaid in front of the diver. That was really cool. And there was that guy who did that awesome one for Hangman. He was promptly fired. Yeah. How many people have edited stories for us? Aside from us, there has just been the two, and Rick has been one of our editors, and uh, Josh is the other, and they've both uh, done several stories for us. And man, do I really want to thank those guys. <laughs> if anything has made my life easier, it's having a little help with the editing of the stories. That's really been a wonderful, great help to the show. Anybody else worth thanking? Well, <laughs> oh boy, I just made friends there, didn't I? We've also got a whole staff of associate editors that uh, we uh, get a lot of help from these people who read our slush pile for us. So, uh, so these are submission readers. Slush pile. That's right. Liz Mirzieski has recently volunteered and has joined the, no the ranks way. of them. So, yeah. She can draw. She can sing. She can dance. She does tricks with her fellow candlesticks. <laughs> and she also edits for us now. That's right. And uh, we've also got Sean Arada, um, Wendy Cooper, Gary Lee. And also we have Amory Lowe helping us out reading. And Steve Bryan, Andrea Smith, Christine Maya Flares. Nicole Suddeth has been reading for us. She's she been maintains our Facebook page. Maintaining our Facebook page and MySpace page. and She sets me up with her friends. It's then nice. she has to make new friends, yeah. sadly. But, <laughs> you know, keep them coming. <laughs> and I think that that's all of our uh, associate editors. But we'd really like to thank them. Because, you know, reading all those stories takes a lot of time. Luckily, we can kind of split it up between everybody and have various groups. And, you know... If you want to volunteer, again, we're always happy to take you because that just gives us another group to uh, spread it out into. And we'd also really like to thank everybody who's donated to us, both of them. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> we'd like to thank the, the several folks who have donated to us over the year. It's really helped us out. Man, at first I was going under trying to pay people. Oh, see, I thought you were worse off now. Well, that's true. I am. But not so much because of the Dune Steve before I was just putting all these things on my credit card, which is probably not the way to go. Uh, you know, another way that people have donated was every once in a while somebody will send us a story, like our friend Jason Sanford, who has said, here, you can take this story for free. Yeah, we've had that a lot. All the authors have been really cool. We get a fair number of them that just say, hey, don't send me that money. Just consider it a donation to the cause. And, you know, it's really cool that uh, the authors think what we do is cool enough or is worthwhile enough that they want to donate what would be their money back to us to keep doing it. I think that's really great. You know, every time somebody sends a donation to me, it really makes me feel like I'm not just wasting my time here. I'm not just blowing all my life down the drain. I think that was a line from a Warrant song. <laughs> I want to know I'm not blowing my life down the drain. Ooh. Sorry, I'll cut that. And along those same lines, a lot of people have sent us in stories. A lot more than the 30-something stories we have run on the show. 
And even if we rejected your story, it is appreciated that you sent it through. I, I know as much as any of you how much work it takes to write. You know, I've been struggling with the story right now, and I just can't bring myself to work on it. I, there's a million things I would rather do. And I know that if there was some kind of reward or light at the end of the tunnel, that maybe I would get off my butt and, and, and write on these things. But you guys have actually done that. And I, I hope that any authors who have sent us stories that we have rejected don't feel like they're not welcome to send us another story. We don't pay attention to the name on there, unless it's Doug McIntyre. But the rest of you, just send in your stories and send us the next one. Please keep writing. It's a fulfilling, awesome art. And uh, thank you for, for sharing that art with us. So, Rish, uh, now that we've come to the end of our one-year extravaganza... What? There was an extravaganza? What, was I in the bathroom when that happened? Uh, okay. Our one-year episode. All right. And I was wondering if you might like to take this opportunity to, uh, you know... What? Well, we've done several episodes, and you've said a, quite a few things that... That What? That you might like to uh, apologize for. Seriously? Yeah. Like what? Well, what have I ever said that I should apologize for? Seriously? Yes. There have been lots of things. Like? Uh, like the time that you said men make better writers than women. Well, yeah, it's true, Big. Writers are ugly and, and girls are pretty. Is that what you said? Well, I think so. Okay. Then maybe you should apologize to writers. Nah, I'm a writer. That's like when a black guy uses the N-word. You know, we're taking the, the wind out of your sails, you know? Okay, well, maybe you should apologize to black guys now. But what? Why? Have I offended them now? Well... Dude, my sister's a black guy. I never say anything bad against them. <laughs> All right. But you have to admit that you tend to say things that people might take in a, you know, inflammatory way. What? Me? When? Uh, how about Stephanie Meyer fans? Oh, them. Well, they can just go take a giant, greasy, unprotected... Warning, today's episode contains the C word. Dude, I wasn't going to say the C word. Mm-hmm. Okay, maybe I was. Never mind. Well, there you go. Well, I still don't think I have anything to apologize for. Rish, Twilight fans notwithstanding, you've offended so many other people. For example... For example, children. Well, I do hate children. See, you can't say something like that. What if there are children listening? There better not be children listening. There might be. In that case, here's something for you kiddies listening in. You can go... Warning. Today's episode contains the Q word. Damn it, announcer man. Would you just let me actually say something before you warn people? No. Maybe you should apologize to announcer man while we've got him here. What? He doesn't have any feelings. Next, you're going to say I, I should apologize to the robot. Rish. What? You've been pretty mean to RO8OT. Which he richly deserves. Okay, fine. Well, how about... Uh, all right, dude. If you think I should apologize, why don't you be me and tell everybody I've offended? Sorry. Do it for you? Sure. Yeah, I think I can do that. Uh, dear followers of the Oprah Book Club, I, Rish Outfield, am very sorry for the time I said that you should be placed in a rocket ship and shot out into space. It was into the sun. I shouldn't have said that. Also, to redheaded people, I apologize for saying I'm terrified of you and dreams of you often make me wet the bed. I got, it was shit the bed. <sighs> dear writers of the future contest winners, I, Rish, am sorry to not be as good as you, and in my jealousy I may have said things that I did not mean. Oh, I meant every word. And I apologize to everyone with ears for my singing. Oh, and there will be lots more where that came from. No, I, Rish Alfield, promise that the singing will stop. Well, I, Big Anklovich, say, I don't mean to make demands, but the word and the deed go hand in hand. How about some information, please? Please, please. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, Rish also wants to apologize for knowing all the words to Making Love Out of Nothing at All by Air Supply. The extended mix. Big wants to apologize for letting the audience know about that. Rish really ought to apologize for saying that 70s sitcom tropes are worse than ritualized third world genital mutilation. Well, they are. Oh, Rish, we're going to be here a long time. Well, probably. Once you start apologizing to all the people you've offended. What, me? 
I'm completely blameless. I'm the good cop of the two of us. Oh, really? You tell that to the St. Louis Jazz and Blues Society. Actually, that line didn't make the episode. I cut it out. All right. Well, you can apologize to Courtney Thorne Smith. Who? The wife on that Jim Belushi show? Why? Oh, you know why. That also edited out. That's not fair. My show, dude. Oh. But what Big does want to apologize to all the people who wrote hate letters over the last few months because I erased them all. Wait, I didn't erase any hate letters. Right, I, I said I erased them. No wonder we hadn't gotten any. That should be another yours, really. Well, you ought to at least apologize to the people who've sent in stories and never heard back. Well, you probably deleted those, too. Just the good ones. Well, uh, Big Anklevich especially wants to apologize to DreamWorks Animation Studio. And its many misguided fans. For saying that they're the reason Full House ran 150 episodes. Yeah, it was actually 192. Really? Good lord. I, uh, Big Anklevich also want to apologize to our friends in the UK for how bad my accents have been. Yes, Rish wants to do that too. Plus Australians. Particularly those uh, in the fine Australian state of New Zealand. Sorry, guys. Uh, Rish. Yes? <sighs> Never mind. So that just about covers it, right? Uh, and Texans? Oh, yes. And Cambodians. And Mexicans. Hey, I'm half Mexican. That's all in fun. Okay, and the Irish. Dirty Irish. And I also want to apologize to the good people of Kentucky. When Rish said that they were like those old women in Greek mythology who had a single eye between them, except that he was talking about brains and teeth. Whoops. That made the air? And Rish wants to apologize for the nasty things that he said about the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Ooh, I want to insult Canadians too. No, I get to say it because I once had my way with one. What? A Mountie? No, a Canadian, jeez. Oh. And lastly, I, Big Anklevich, wish to apologize to Harvey Fivish Dunstief, the assistant chemist behind the polio vaccine, for stealing your last name for my podcast. How long have you known? For quite some time, actually. My uncle had polio. Your uncle who touched you? No, the other one. This is another long episode, dude. We probably should apologize to our listeners for... Listener... Singular. For going long. And I want to apologize to you, Rish. Really? For what? For this. Oh. That's our show for today. Oh, but those. I think you dislocated by those. All right, that's our show, everybody. Uh, I'm Big Enklevich. <clears throat> and I'm Rish Outfield. It's their time up there, but down here, it's our time. It's our time down here. Good night. Thank you for listening. At the Steve Audio Fiction Magazine, we pay our authors. So if you love good fiction and want to see it continue, please donate. The Steve is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone. <laughs> but you may not charge for them or alter them. Take two. The second story is The Shortest Gorse. <clears throat> back, back into the closet. The shortest story. The second story is The Shortest Gorse. <laughs> Sorry. We're never going to get to your story. We're just doing one story today.